In the spring of 1948, the Presleys moved to Memphis, and the 13-year-old Elvis was suddenly thrust into one of the most dynamic music environments in all the world. Vernon Presley, whose unskilled background included truck driving and house painting, landed a job at the United Paint Company. Gladys, for her part, began working at Brittling's Cafeteria in downtown Memphis, waitressing in order to help the struggling family put food on the table. The Presley's home was in the Lauderdale Courts, a low-income federal housing project located close proximity to L.C. Hume's high school. Elvis's high school years were difficult ones, and his intense shyness, his lack of self-confidence, and his almost complete exclusion from the school's in-crowd fueled an inner desire to be somebody and dream of a life of undisputed greatness. But in the beginning, Elvis Presley was just a hick kid from Tupelo who couldn't even play football after school because his mother was afraid he'd be hurt. Elvis instead worked evenings as an usher at the Lowe's State Theater, where he earned the grand total of $14 a week. When he was really short of cash, he sold his blood. But the cloud of abject poverty could never be completely shaken from the Presley household, and Elvis, with nothing but the love of his mother to encourage him, desperately sought any form of escape. He found it on Beale Street. The short avenue had etched a place in Memphis's fabled history of music and culture long before Elvis's arrival. A, a place where life was a song from dusk to dawn had the young Elvis completely captivated. But the most significant element of Beale Street in terms of Elvis's developing persona was the Lansky Brothers clothing store. As soon as he'd saved up the money, Elvis bought a loud gab shirt with a collar turned up in the best Mr. B fashion, a style pioneered by the brilliant black jazz vocalist, Billy Eckstein. And when he was old enough to shave, Elvis started wearing his sideburns long and had his long hair styled at a beautician salon instead of a barber shop. This sudden transformation from Tupelo Hillbilly to colorfully dressed, long-haired iconoclast led to constant conflict among Elvis's crew-cutted peers, who harassed Elvis, picked fights with him, and challenged the teenager to back up his revitalized outer persona with some similar inner uniqueness. Elvis did just that when he graduated high school in June 1953. He got a job driving a truck for the Crown Electric Company for $35 a week and he spent his evenings studying to be an electrician so he could someday collect union wages. But through it all, he kept strumming his old guitar, practicing chords with the instruction book, and imitating the songs he heard on radio station WDAI. WDAI was the first black radio station in Memphis, and its dynamic disc jockeys, B.B. King and Rufus Thomas, who later went on a spectacular careers of their own, programmed a wild selection of music that quickly made WDAI the toast of Southern radio. Spine-tingling gospel recordings, foot-stomping blues, mudcat rhythm and jazz from the likes of Holland Wolf, Muddy Waters, and Ray Charles were played all night. Elvis listened to it all with a blind passion, drinking in the music like a sponge. And when he had a spare hour and an extra dollar, he headed on down to Beale Street to see the real thing. With his mother's birthday on the horizon, and with Elvis wanting to give her an extra special present, he walked into the Sun Recording Service one afternoon with his guitar in hand. He paid his four dollars, stepped into the tiny recording booth, and quietly set about waxing the very first record of his career, an elegant version of the Ink Spots' My Happiness.